Hi, I'm Raj K, and today I'm going to be taking you through the Canon EOS R50. This little guy here. The EOS R50 is the compact, video-centric, aps size sensor uh, mirrorless camera from Canon. So it's designed to work very quickly. It can shoot 12 frames per second me mechanical or 15 frames per second in uh, electronic shutter. It has a 24 megapixel sensor. And it's really, really fantastic at the sort of video content side of things. So 4K video, live streaming all built in. It's plug and play via USB, uh, so you can actually use it as a webcam. It's a really capable little camera, and that's the key thing. It is very little. It is nice and compact, easy to stow away in a little bag, and even the lens folds away when you're not using it, so it kind of goes into a smaller, um, compact form. I really love this camera. It's kind of a, a spiritual successor to the M50, if you were familiar with that. Um, so the R50 is a much more up-to-date version of that, has better autofocus, better low light performance, better sensor overall, and better video performance. So in this video, I'm gonna be taking you through all of the hardware side of things. I'll take you through all the features of the camera, and then I'm gonna delve into the menu and show you uh, a few different setups that I like, but particularly just take you through what all the things in the menu mean and uh, how to get the best out of this little piece of kit. Grab yourself a cup of tea, let's get stuck in. So on the hardware side of things, we have a nice and compact body, as I said. We've got a fully articulated screen, which is lovely if you're shooting high up or low down. Um, when you get the camera out of the box, if you, you've got it with the 1845 kit lens, um, it will say set the lens to the shooting position. And what that means is the lens is sort of folded away into a compact um, mode. You just need to twist it over to the 18 mil, and then you will be in the shooting position. You can zoom it out to 45 and back to 18. And when you want to put it away, just uh, turn it all the way around. It won't let you shoot until you're in the shooting position. Um, and so that's the that front side of things. If you want to remove the lens, you just hold the button there, twist, take it off, just that button there, and then place it back on and line up the red dot with the red dot. Um, on the front, there isn't really anything else. On the top, we'll go. So we've got the shutter button on the very front here. We've got a little dial for uh, adjusting your exposure settings and moving through the menus and things like that. Right next to that, we have a record button. So we have this little red dot record button. And that will allow us to record videos even if we're in stills modes. Um, but if you go into the video mode, you'll get more control over your video settings. And then we have the mode dial on the top, which we'll come back to. And we have the on off switch just next to the mode dial, which makes it really lovely for one handed operation. You can very easily turn it on with your thumb, change the mode, change your settings. You don't even need to use your left hand at all. Over on the side here, on the grip, we have uh, a little flap which has two ports, so we can uncover that. And we have a uh, HDMI port and a USB-C port. So the HDMI is HDMI micro. And with the HDMI micro port, you can use it to record to an external recorder if you wanted to uh, kind of use a larger screen and uh, monitor your video, as well as record a slightly better quality video out of the HDMI. Um, the other thing you can do is connect it up to a TV and actually just view your footage and view your images straight from the camera. And you can use the USB-C port to charge the camera, but you could also take your images off um, using that as well. Uh, but I generally recommend using the, uh, a card reader, taking your SD card out and putting it in a card reader. The other thing you can do with that is it's um, completely compatible as a plug and play webcam. So you can use it directly into your computer your computer will recognize it as a webcam and you can then use it for streaming or use it for your uh, sort of Zoom calls or uh, Teams meetings and things like that for a much nicer looking um, image in your uh, professional life. So that's that side. We have a couple of little anchors, silver anchors on the top here. Uh, that's for your strap that will come in the box. And then on the back we have um, the viewfinder. So this is a fully electronic viewfinder which is really high quality and keeps up with fast moving subjects. Um, and just underneath that is a little slider. It's a little hard to see on video, but that is 
the slider for your diopter adjustment. So if you look through the viewfinder and it's not looking perfectly sharp, look at the text through the viewfinder and just adjust that slider. That slider will focus the lens in this um, viewfinder to ensure that you're getting uh, what you see is what you're going to get. On the top we have uh, a little pop-up flash gun as well, so useful in low light situations, and we have this hot shoe. So the hot shoe is a little different to some of the other Canon uh, cameras in the range. We don't have the, the sort of standard pin uh, lineup. What we do have is right at the top, which is very hard to see, uh, is a row of pins right at the very front, which is the multi-function shoe. And the reason for this is the uh, camera is generally going to be used for sort of video production um, functionality, and those pins are more useful for that. Um, and what this does is allow you to connect uh, microphones, for example, that are compatible with these pins, and they um, are powered by the camera, so they don't have a battery in them, and all of the communication happens through this port. The advantage of that is you don't have to run a little cable from the microphone into the side of the camera. It's all happening on um, through that connector. If you want to use standard flash guns with this camera, you can do. There is an ADE-1 um, adapter that you can slide on the top there and then it will make this compatible with any of the standard flash guns um, pre sort of EL5 um, level. So EL5 is directly compatible with this because it has that multi-function shoe. Some of the older flash guns or any older uh, flash guns that were compatible with your Canon Digital SLRs will be compatible with that adapter. Right, on the back here we have another, uh, some other buttons. So we have the exposure lock button just there. We have uh, the focus group button, uh, which will allow you to change the sort of uh, setup of the focusing as a shortcut. Um, we have an info button, and then we have the sort of D-pad. Um, on the D-pad, we have various different shortcuts to things. So we can switch between auto and manual focus. We can very quickly get to exposure compensation. The drive mode is there, so you can set it from single shot to burst. And we have the bin button down the bottom, so you can erase your images. Um, and in the middle, you'll see it says Q and set. And so set is, you know, saying yes and okay to setting up your settings, but the Q is the shortcut menu, the quick access menu, uh, which I'll come on to in a little while. Then we have P uh, the playback menu there at the bottom, which will allow you to view your images and videos, and the menu to go to the full menu. Now, a lot of the time you won't need to go to the full menu uh, because everything you need is on the quick access menu. Um, however, we will go through the entire menu system so you know what everything is. On the very bottom, we have a couple of labels there, that's for myself, so um, I know which camera this is. But uh, the, we have a screw hole, which is a quarter inch thread, um, which is a standardized thing for all uh, cameras in the industry, really. So any kind of tripod accessory should fit on this camera perfectly happily. And then we have a little um, battery cover. So underneath the battery cover, we have the LPE17 batteries and we have a uh, SD card slot. <sighs> I think that's it. Oh, and the other thing we have on this side is we have a microphone port. Almost missed that one. Um, so the microphone port allows you to, if you don't have any of the newer um, microphones that are compatible with the uh, multifunction shoe, you can use a 3.5 mm jack into the microphone port there as well. Um, the camera does have built-in audio, um, but you're always going to get, um, sort of built-in microphone, sorry, but you will always get better audio from an external microphone. At the moment I'm wearing a wireless lav mic for example and that allows me um, better quality audio. You could have a little directional microphone uh, just sitting on the hot shoe. There's loads of options out there. Okay let's get started on the um, menu side of things and in order to do that I've got mine hooked up via the HDMI lead to my laptop which is down here via a capture card device. What this is enabling me to do is record everything that the uh, camera is doing and it does mean that it won't show me on this little back screen, it'll only show me on the laptop over there. So I'm going to be looking down there a little bit. Um, we'll start with the mode dial. So I'm currently in Scene Intelligent Automatic, so uh, this is the camera's fully auto. And what this does is allow the camera to figure out what you're photographing and adjust the settings accordingly. If you're doing a portrait, even a backlit portrait, it will specifically figure that out. 
and give you the correct settings. It does mean that you don't get a lot of options to override. So if I show you the Q menu in this mode, we have pretty basic options. We can pick presets, we can set the background blur or brightness and contrast and things, um, but it sort of simplifies it, which is great um, if you're sort of new to photography and you just want to be able to get a picture and adjust the overall look of it without needing to sort of understand any of the rest of it. Uh, but if you wanted a little bit more control over how the focusing system behaves and things like that, you'd be better off in P. So in program auto, um, the camera's still taking care of the exposure. You don't need to worry too much about that, but you get the full Q menu uh, that you can see here, which will allow you a little bit more control over things like the focusing system and the white balance and things like that, which just gives you a little bit more um, granular control over how the thing is behaving. So, um, that's program auto. I'm gonna switch back to intelligent auto and go one further the other way. So we've got hybrid auto. Hybrid auto is similar to the fully automatic, uh, but what it does is it will record a small amount of video every time you take a picture. And then it will combine all of that into a little movie of highlight video clips. This is a really lovely way to shoot something like uh, your Christmas holidays or you know summer holidays, that sort of thing, because you don't have to think about doing stills and video, it just does it for you. Um, the lovely thing about this, I actually found this entirely by accident over Christmas, and because um, I had it in the wrong mode and I didn't know what it did, and we ended up with this lovely highlight reel at the end of the Christmas, and it's absolutely hilarious. So, uh, that's that one. Below that we have scene selection, so if you know the type of photography, you're doing, um, you can go in here and choose the scene and we can pick from a number of different things. We've got food, close up panning, kids, um, panoramic shots, uh, portrait modes, um, silent shutter modes. Now you, all of these things, you can go in and do that manually if you wanted to, um, particularly the silent shutter, you don't have to go into the scene selection mode for this. You can do that in any mode. Um, but this is a really lovely way of just telling the camera roughly what you're doing and it will figure out the rest for you. Particularly panoramic shot, um, it'll combine multiple images as you take a sort of as you take images sort of turning as you go, and it will combine that to give you a lovely panora panoramic shot. Um, coming out of that, we'll go to the next one, which is creative filters mode. Um, in creative filters mode, this is basically applying a look to your images kind of funky looking things. So we've got toy camera effects, we've got miniature effects, uh, fish eye, soft focus. It's worth having a little play in here, that's quite fun. And oops, then we're gonna go over to the next one, which is video, and I'm not gonna go into this too much because I'll come into it a bit later. Then we have the creative modes, the sort of more manual modes, which are uh, fully manual, um, which gives you full control over your exposure, you're taking control of your uh, shutter speed and your aperture. And you can put the ISO in manual or have it in automatic, it's entirely up to you. Um, just to be completely clear on manual, this doesn't mean that you have to use manual focus. This is entirely independent of that. This is only about exposure. Um, with the AV and TV, you have aperture value and time value. So aperture priority or time um, shutter priority. The these are used for giving you some more creative control while the camera still takes care of the exposure. So you take care of the aperture. If you wanna have a shallower depth of field, you'd set a larger aperture in AV, or you want the full depth of field, so you want everything in focus from back, front to back, you'd use a, uh, a smaller aperture, a larger number, F number. The camera will take care of the rest of the exposure. Likewise, in shutter priority, um, you can set your shutter speed from uh, very, very fast, you're freezing the action, or you can set it to um, a bit slower so you can get this sort of flowing water effect with the waterfall. It's a really easy way to uh, get creative control without having to worry too much about getting the exposure correct because the camera will take care of it. Now, that's the mode dial. I'm going to leave it in program auto and show you um, the Q menu in this mode. So we're gonna hit Q, and the Q is gonna bring up a menu on either side of the screen. And this brings up all of these different things that are your most used settings, so things that you might need to get to quite regularly. Um, the first one is the autofocus groupings. 
And if you are familiar with some of the older um, mirrorless cameras that we had, you had a face detect mode um, in here as well. You don't have it anymore because it's possible in any of these different groupings. So just above, you can see the button that says info enable. Um, so if I tap info, it says enable or disable. If I disable that, it removes the tracking stuff. If I enable that, it enables the tracking stuff. So if I put it on one spot now and start the autofocus, it'll track the subject. If I disable that um, by pressing info, it will only focus on what's in the box. So we don't have the tracking um, enabled on there. What we can do is have that in any of these groups. So we can have it in a larger area and turn on the tracking. And it will just find a subject to track, which is lovely. We can also go in here and have flexible zones. Um, and the flexible zones are lovely because you can actually uh, adjust those. So if I tap the um, focus group button there, I can make them narrower or wider. And you, know, you can make this work for the, whatever area of photography you do. Um, okay. The next one below that is the drive, uh, sorry, the, um, the focus uh, AF operation. So we've got servo, one shot, or AI focus. One shot, as you hold the shutter button down, half press the shutter button, it will focus and it will lock. It will usually beep and um, let you know it's in focus and then and stop focusing. If you're photographing moving subjects, this isn't great um, because by the time that you've, it's beeped and locked focus and you've taken the picture, in that time between it locking and you taking a picture, it'll probably have moved. So you want it in um, AI focus for that. Sorry, you want it in servo for that um, because that's continually going to uh, drive the autofocus while you're half pressing the shutter button. AI focus is a hybrid of the two. Um, it will automatically switch between one shot and servo depending on what it thinks you, you need. Um, this can work quite well in many cases, but if you know the subject's moving, it's better to have it in AI servo because you're already just letting the camera know that that's how it should behave. Right, below that we have the subject to detect. Currently it's an automatic. Um, we have people, we have animals, and we have vehicles with spot detection, which I'll come back to, and then we have none. Um, auto is great. It works pretty well for all situations. And I generally would leave it in this, but if you know you're photographing animals, it's better to put it in the animal mode. And the reason for this is it will detect that animal from further away. It's able to see um, that you're, uh, you know, it's able to know that you're trying to focus on an animal, so it's looking specifically for that. So it can find it smaller in the frame and further away. Um, the other one that I was going to mention is the uh, vehicles. So vehicles is sort of motor cars and motorbikes, but it will actually pick out the driver or rider of those vehicles. And that's what spot detection is. So spot detection is uh, enabled or disabled. So when it says enable, it's actually enabled already. Um, and that is the, the to pick out the helmet or the, the, the face of the driver or rider of that vehicle, which is really clever. With animals, we were able to do birds, cats, and dogs, um, and animals that kind of look like that. Um, I've actually had pretty good success with squirrels, picking out the eye of a squirrel as well, which is pretty cool. Um, it works really, really great. Um, below that we have image quality, so we can set the size of the JPEG, or we can tap the info button and say uh, what size raw image we want. You can have compressed raw uh, or full raw. So C raw is like a uh, the file size is smaller, it's, it's nearly half the size of uh, full RAW. It's still bigger than JPEGs, so you'll get some flexibility in terms of editing, but not as much as you would with a full RAW image. Um, you'll notice here that I've currently got it to uh, RAW and JPEG, so on the left-hand side it says RAW plus uh, large L. Um, you can record two copies of your image, one RAW and one JPEG, to the same card, which is really nice. Because it does mean that sometimes you don't need to do any editing and you just want to um, you know, ping off an image to someone. Um, it's much easier to do so with just the JPEG and then you don't have to process it. Having both on the card is quite useful for that. Down below that is metering mode, so I can switch between um, 
what type of metering this is what part of the sensor the camera is taking into account when it's trying to decide the exposure so evaluative metering takes into uh, account a lot of the scene um, partial metering is for uh, like a slightly narrows it down a bit more and then spot metering is literally just the middle of the image and this is great if your subject is in the middle but if your subject is off to the side um, you're kind of metering for the background then and it doesn't quite make sense so uh, what you use will um, be based on trial and error I would say it'd be worth having a little play and seeing what works for you on the other side we have flicker detection so anti-flicker shoot um, the Flicker detection is a really, really clever piece of uh, technology that basically allows you more consistent lighting results when you're shooting indoors. When you're inside, um, I usually say every um, artificial light has a bit of a flicker. It turns out mine don't in here. I have pretty good um, LED lighting, so it doesn't flicker. But uh, ordinarily, they are flickering. And what's happening is you've got this wave of light. Um, and what the camera does is detect that and take a picture at the peak every single time and this allows you much more consistent lighting because otherwise if it hit it when it was at the bottom you'd suddenly get a really dark image um, and you'd be wondering why and it wasn't because you had the exposure wrong it just took it at the wrong moment it does mean when you're shooting in full burst mode that it will slow that burst down a little bit um, just to make sure that it's able to hit those peaks every single time um, but it does mean that you get that consistent lighting result and uh, the image looks great Below that is white balance. We have um, the option to set our tone of the image um, based on the lighting in the environment. So if you are in daylight, uh, you want the whites to look like they're in daylight. So you can pick one of the presets here, or you can set it to auto. And auto actually has two options. So we have auto ambience priority and we have ambient, uh, white priority. You notice the shift here from slightly more orange to more white. Now, you, this is really a bit of perf personal preference here. I tend to find that I prefer ambience priority because if the room is warm, I want it to show that it was warm at the time. Uh, if I go back out of that, I can go across to uh, some of the others. We have custom modes. We can, we can take a picture of a, a gray card and set a custom uh, white balance. Or right down the end, we have color temperature. Um, and I quite like color temperature because it's really easy to use. It's just a dial that brings it cooler or warmer. And I tend to set mine um, somewhere around 5,500 um, Kelvin, which is just a bit warmer than daylight, um, which is around 5,000 Kelvin. And that tends to do me for most things. Below that, we have picture style, um, which is how the camera processes the image to give you a preview. If you're shooting in RAW, this is kind of ignored by most software except for Digital Photo Professional, which is Canon's RAW editing software. Um, if you're using sort of Adobe Photoshop or any others, then it will kind of ignore this um, anyway. So I would then use it in neutral or faithful because it's the closest to um, the raw image that you're going to get. So it doesn't look different on the back screen to when it does on the computer. If you uh, are shooting in JPEG, this will make more of an impact because it will bake it into the image. So I would pick one that sort of suits the, the, the style of thing you're doing. So landscape makes the blues and greens a little bit more vivid and adds a little bit more of a uh, contrast to it. Um, portraiture is more flattering on the skin uh, and you know, th these sort of things. For the most part, as I say, I use uh, neutral, I think. Creative filters below that. So the uh, creative filter mode we had on the mode dial, you can add that to your images in any of the more sort of uh, more controlled modes where you've got manual uh, and more control over the rest of the settings. So you don't have to miss out on those creative filters. Below that we have still image aspect ratio, three by two, four by three, 16 by nine, or square images one by one. Um, if you're shooting in raw, it will still give you the full image but it will show you a little outline of what that uh, what the um, thing was in the viewfinder. Um, if you're shooting in JPEG, you'll only get the square image. You won't get the rest of the information. And that's the Q menu. The other Q menu, there is two. If I cycle through the info, 
Um, so I'm having a look through info, which is basically uh, changing the information that's on the on the screen. And this is customizable, which we'll show you later. Um, we actually end up on this screen, which will be familiar to you if you're used to a digital SLR. So on the DSLRs, the back screen used to look like this. I can press Q and we have much of the same options that we had in the other Q menu, but we do have a couple that are different. So we have easier access to the flash uh, exposure compensation. So if you have an external flash or you're using this pop-up flash, this will adjust the brightness of that flash relative to the rest of the image. Because sometimes the flash can be a little bit too hot. You know, if the, if the person's quite pale or you're, they're wearing light clothing, the flash can be a bit too bright on them. So you can reduce it here. Um, we also have quick access to, uh, to this is uh, auto lighting optimizer. So auto lighting optimizer will, even in the more creative modes like uh, program and TV, it will just allow the camera to um, optimize the lighting for the subject if they're backlit, that type of thing. Um, the other ones we have that are different is, that's it. That's all the ones that are different in here. So now we're gonna delve into the full menu. I'm gonna hit menu and we're gonna start with red menu one. Red menu one, we have image quality, uh, much in the same way I showed you in the Q menu. We can go in here and set raw or JPEG. You'll notice there it says JPEG or HEIF, H-E-I-F, which is high efficiency image format. Um, this is a better quality version of JPEG. It's a 10 bit image file format. Um, it's not commonly used and there are not everything uh, supports it currently. So uh, JPEG is generally used for the most part, but I will show you where you can use HEF. So it'll either be JPEG and HEF, JPEG or HEF, not both at the same time. And you can set that somewhere else in the menu. Still image aspect ratio, as I showed you earlier, you can set that as well. So you can have square images if you wanted to. And you can set digital teleconverter. If you have this set to, I think it's just JPEG, isn't it? No, if you have uh, raw off, you can set digital teleconverter. You can set two times or four times. So this gives you a little bit more reach out of your lenses. It essentially crops into the image for you. Right, the next one is exposure compensation um, on Red Menu 2. There are much quicker ways of getting to this. If you just want to change the exposure compensation, it was on the Q menu uh, or just in one of the dials. However, what this does also give you is auto exposure bracketing. So if you use the top wheel in this menu, you'll notice that we get three lines and this is allowing us to take um, three pictures at different exposures of the same thing. So you could take one that's lower, one that's higher and one that's in the middle. I'm going to turn that off for now. ISO speed settings. Um, we can go in here and we can adjust the current ISO, but obviously there are quicker ways of doing that by uh, using the Q screen or just using one of the dials. Uh, or tapping the ISO button on the top, which I'm not sure I mentioned, but um, yeah, there's an ISO button shortcut on the top of the camera. The maximum of auto you can set here as well. So if you know that you don't really want the camera to go above 6400 ISO uh, in auto, you can actually limit it. Below that we have HDR shooting in HDR PQ mode. So this is a uh, standardized version of HDR. So this is not make, taking multiple images. This is the sort of TV standard of um, HDR. And if you turn this on, the camera will be shooting in HEF mode. Um, and it does here recommend that you set highlight tone priority to enable and I will come on to that when we come into it in the setting. Um, HDR mode below that is the multiple image HDR so we can set that to take multiple pictures and combine them in camera. It can also align those images so if you're hand holding you don't have to hold it perfectly perfectly steady if you don't have a tripod and it will align those images. It will mean it crops in slightly, but it will be able to align those pictures for you. Um, so that's HDR in that mode. Let me turn that off so we can use the other settings. Below that, auto lighting optimizer. I mentioned that earlier. This um, basically allows the camera to 
determine the exposure slightly for uh, your subject matter. Highlight tone priority. This basically picks out where the uh, bright areas of the image are and make sure that they don't clip, so they don't go overexposed. It kind of brings them down a touch. Anti-flicker shoots below that, we've already mentioned in the Q menu, so this is um, about making sure that you're getting consistent lighting in indoor um, artificially lit situations. Red menu three, flash control. So we can go in here and we can set settings for the built-in flash or the external flash. So we can actually set up the um, built-in flash in fully manual and set the exposure that we want for it. Um, or we can set the exposure compensation. As I showed you, there is a quicker way to get to that. We can even set up sh the shutter sync so we can have a first curtain or second curtain. Um, I'm not gonna massively go into this. Um, because it's a little bit more complex, but this is whether the camera takes fires the flash when you first open the shutter or when it closes the shutter. So if you're doing a long exposure, you can have it right at the beginning or at the end of the exposure. Um, external flash function settings and custom function settings, it won't let me go into because I don't have one connected at the moment. Um, but one thing that is useful here is the ETTL balance. So we can set the standard to ambient priority, flash priority, or standard. Um, and this is the sort of what's going to be most prominent in the image in terms of the, the light source. Do you want it to be more flash based or more of the ambience of the room? I tend to prefer ambience priority because I don't like my images to look really flashy um, in that sense. The next one is the metering for face priority. So we can have evaluative average or face priority for the metering. And um, this is you know, what kind of part of the frame the image is taking into account to decide the exposure of the flash. And I uh, like face priority because usually if I'm using flash, it is for someone's, uh, I'm taking a picture of someone um, and you want their face to be the most correctly exposed part of the image. Uh, right, I won't go too much into the rest of the detail of that. Below that is metering mode, as I mentioned earlier. We have partial spot or uh, evaluative and center weighted. This is how much of the frame it's taking into account when it's deciding the exposure. Spot metering is just the middle. It doesn't follow the focusing point around, um, just so you know. Red menu four, we can set the white balance here, much in the same way we could in the Q menu. Um, and here we can also set up the custom white balance. So if you have a memory card in the camera, you can pick an image that you've taken a picture of a gray card or a white wall or something, and you can set your custom white balance accordingly. Um, white balance shift, we can actually go in here and set the colors uh, and shift the colors around a little bit. If you're shooting in RAW, I don't tend to bother with this because you can just do this in post-production. But if you're shooting in JPEG and you need to shift the colors because you think it's slightly too blue or whatever, uh, because there's a weird color cast in the room, this can help with that. Below that we have color space, sRGB or Adobe RGB. Now color spaces are the, 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 the range of colors that you're able to capture or able to use from the, from the image. If you're shooting in RAW, you're capturing all of the colors uh, that the camera is capable of capturing, which is more than Adobe RGB anyway. So you can always change this in your RAW editor. Um, like Adobe Camera RAW, for example, um, will allow you to change from an sRGB or uh, uh, Adobe RGB or uh, even other color spaces as well. Where you'd want to change this um, is if you're printing, Adobe RGB has a larger color space than sRGB, so you have more colors. So that's quite useful if you want to print your images and you can work in Adobe RGB and print in Adobe RGB. Um, the problem with that is the internet works in sRGB. So if you are using your images and you're posting them on Instagram or uh, any other online platforms, you'll notice if you shoot in Adobe RGB, particularly with Instagram, as soon as you load them into Instagram, it'll, the colors will shift um, once they're, you sort of pick an image. And that's it bringing that color space from Adobe RGB down into sRGB. And you have no control over that. So what I tend to do and what I recommend is you work in Adobe RGB, uh, sorry, you, work, you shoot and work in sRGB and by doing that, you have control over what that image is going to look like at the end. Um, if you leave it up to uh, the whim of all the software and internet browsers and, and, and anyone else uh, to decide that shift, every time you look at the image on a different 
um, platform, it's going to look slightly different. So um, I tend not to work in Adobe RGB for the most part. Picture style below that, um, that's the one I mentioned earlier with uh, in the key menu where we've got um, what the preview of your image is going to look like and what the uh, processing is for the JPEG. And we can actually set the clarity as well here. So um, again, I think this is only in, in JPEG uh, and not necessarily in the RAWs, but this is your micro contrast um, in the image. Shooting creative filters, we can add those here as well, which I mentioned earlier in the Q menu. Uh, Red menu five, lens aberration collection. So this is about the correction data that's stored in the lenses. The great advantage of the RF system is that the lens correction data is actually stored in these lenses. Um, so it is worth going in here and uh, enabling that. Digital lens optimizer is the one that will set up the uh, camera to correct that Data, correct the images because no lens is perfect, right? So these lenses are even more compact, so they are designed in a way that means that they are um, they benefit from these di this digital lens correction quite um, well. Peripheral illumination correction, turning that on, um, removes any vignetting, um, so the sort of darker areas in the corner of the images. Um, I turn this off or turn this on sometimes. I, I kind of like uh, the character of a lens um, sometimes. So below that long exposure noise reduction, when you're doing long exposures, the sensor heats up and builds up noise and this will remove that. High ISOs, when you push the sensitivity of the sensor, inevitably you build up noise. So this is gonna um, help reduce that. And then below that you have dust delete data. So you can actually set up the camera to um, have the data for removing any dust spots on the, the sensor. Um, it's worth having a look in the manual for details on how to set this up. I've never done it. Right, red menu six, focus bracketing. We can go in here and set up focus bracketing, which is a very, very cool feature. And we can even set depth composite as well. So what this is doing is enabling us to take a picture at a certain distance, and then it will take multiple pictures at different distances, um, focus distances. So, and then it will combine that. So if you have depth composite, you can actually combine all of those images to give you a, uh, an image that has the entire image in focus. Now this is particularly useful for macro work because if you've ever done macro, you know that your depth of field goes very, very, very small. So you might get the antenna of an insect, but not the rest of the insect. Um, so you can set the camera up on a tripod, take multiple images, and it's going to um, focus at different parts of that insect and combine them. You don't have to combine them in camera. I tend to do it in post-production because I find that you get more flexibility over how much of the image is in focus then. Um, right, below that we have drive mode, so we can set high-speed continuous um, plus for high-speed shooting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a shortcut button to this, so you don't need to go into the menu for it. It's just press right on the D-pad. Um, high-speed continuous plus is very fast, so if I take a picture now, it's gonna be rapid. Um, and then we can go in and set high speed continuous, a low speed, self timer for 10 seconds, two seconds, and then the end one is self timer continuous. So it will take multiple pictures at the end of the self timer. And um, you can set that below there. So you can set it to say four photos at the end of the self timer. It saves you running back and forth so many times. Um, right, let's set that to single shooting again. Below that we have the silent shutter function that will uh, enable the camera to be completely silent, doesn't do any of the beeping or anything like that, uh, but it can't be used when you have uh, the anti-flicker shoot turned on. Shutter mode, below that, electronic first cut nor electronic. So if you are shooting electronic, the, the camera is silent, similar to the silent mode, but it will, it will make a sound for you uh, to tell you've taken a picture. Um, the disadvantage to electronic shutter is that in with a very fast moving subjects that are going across the frame, you can introduce some distortion because it's not able to read from the sensor quick enough. And the you get an effect called rolling shutter, so the, the, the subject looks a bit distorted. The other thing is that in um, an indoor environment with flickering lighting, you can get some banding, so that's something to be aware of. And you can't use it with flash either on this camera, so uh, you'd need to use electronic first curtain. All of those problems uh, and have a solution, which is to use electronic first curtain for those situations. Um, 
Below that we have release without card, so we can turn this off. Uh, the camera will not be able to take a picture without a memory card in it. Um, take it from experience, it's worth setting that to disable. Um, right, image stabilization mode. We can set the IS, uh, which is in the lens in this camera, um, to on or off, or we can set a digital image stabilization for video. If the lens has a switch on it for IS, then that will override this and the option will be grayed out. Um, we can customize the quick control menu that I showed you earlier. And below that we can set the touch shutter, so we can use the touch screen to tap to focus and it will take a picture as well. Um, I tend to turn that off because if I'm walking around I accidentally tap it a lot and it means I've got random photos of the floor. Um, image review, how long the uh, image is held on the back screen for you when after you've taken a picture. We can set high speed display, now you need to be in uh, high speed um, drive mode for this and this enables that to keep up with it a little bit better. Metering timer is when you've half pressed the button how long it holds that metering for. Um, red menu 8, display simulation, we can set the uh, display simulation for different situations differently. So. Um, the great advantage to mirrorless is that what you see is what you get. So when you change the exposure, it shows you that in the viewfinder. If you don't like that and you want it to be more like a digital SLR, you can turn that off. You can actually have it set to show your exposure and your depth of field. So as you change your depth of field or your aperture, it will show you that depth of field change. Um, or you can disable it there. Um, if you're using flashes that aren't necessarily recognized by the camera, then you might need to disable it so that because you're exposing for the flash, it can't know that. So it, it needs to... Um, just turn off the exposure simulation. Below that we have OVF simulation view assist, so this is turning your uh, electronic viewfinder almost into a um, optical viewfinder, so it uses the sort of large dynamic range and simulates it looking like a um, optical viewfinder. It will mean what you see isn't what you get anymore, but it gives you a more natural look and, and can make it more familiar to you if you're used to a digital SLR. Here you can toggle the information that you get in your shooting. Um, so you can screen info settings. So the ones that I mentioned earlier when you're toggling through info, um, which one of these appear and don't appear. Um, we can set up uh, things like grids. I tend to set up a grid to help with composition. I, I like having that. Um, we can change the histogram thing um, from brightness to RGB. So you've got uh, split channel RG, um, RGB histograms, which is quite useful for some people, and lens information display. You can set, show your distance um, of focus and things. Reverse display, I think, is to do with the flip out screen, whether it flips over the, um, the, the, the screen when you've flipped it all the way around, so that you're, when you're doing a selfie, you can actually see yourself as uh, correctly or whether it's reversed. Um, viewfinder display format, we can crop in slightly um, in the viewfinder. I don't really know why. I think it's to do with the way you're wearing glasses or not. It can be a little bit more comfortable or easier to see. Uh, below that display performance, um, we can have it set to power saving or smooth, so it's gonna use a slightly higher frame rate to um, give you a smoother image in the viewfinder, but it does use a little bit more power. Red menu nine, movie record settings. Um, we have options here which are to do with when you hit the record button, when you're in stills mode, not when you are uh, in video mode. So we can set up our settings here from 4K, full HD, uh, at different frame rates. We have 29.97 or 23.98, which is essentially 30 or 24 frames per second. Um, and in full HD, we can do 60 frames, 30 frames, or 24 frames, or, you know, there. Equivalent. Uh, sound recording, we can set the audio levels. Um, so if you're doing video, Often you want to set the levels manually because if you have a quiet point in the video, it can be looking for audio, so it kind of uh, increases the sensitivity and you pick up background noise then. Um, ISO speed settings below that in video, so you can set the automatic maximum and um, slow shutter or not, so this is when it's dark, uh, does it kind of reduce the frame rate to the point where it's a bit jagged or it keeps it smooth, but does mean that the um, image might be slightly darker. All right, the next one down is auto level, which I've just had to look up because I couldn't remember what it was. 
And what that does is uses the image stabilization system to help keep your videos level. So if you're hand holding it and you're trying to keep a straight horizon, um, to an extent it won't be able to do it when you're way off, um, but it will actually hold the uh, image level, which is really, really clever. Below that we can set the but shutter button function, what the, the shutter button does when you're recording video. Um, right, AF menu one. AF operation, I've got currently to AI focus, we've got one shot and servo, so one shot is when you half press the shutter button, it picks focus and locks, or servo it continually focuses, um, and AI focus is a hybrid between the two, as I mentioned earlier in the Q menu bit. Um, AF area, we can pick the grouping. Um, there are quicker ways to get to this than go into the menu, so I don't tend to do that, as I mentioned in the Q area. Whole area tracking server AF. So this is the bit where I said you can tap info to enable or disable it. This is the same setting in the menu. And we can pick the subject to detect here. So we've got um, people, animals, vehicles, um, or none. And the animals are birds, cats, and dogs. Below that we have eye detection. So eye detection is whether the camera is picking out the eye specifically in the image. If you're uh, photographing people, it will still pick out the face and it will still focus on the face. Um, but this is specifically about the eyes. Uh, below that we have focus mode, we can set the camera to manual focus or autofocus here. The next one is AF menu. So in the autofocus menu we have the AF operation, which I showed you in the Q menu. We have AI focus, one shot or servo, one shot locks the autofocus once it finds it. Servo continually focuses while you're half pressing the button. AI focus is a nice hybrid between the two. AF area, we can pick them, uh, the groupings here. As I mentioned earlier in the Q menu, there are quicker ways of finding this, and um, it is more obvious when you can see it on the screen as well, overlaying your image. Whole area tracking server AF. Um, this is where, when you're picking your group on the Q menu, it says the info to enable or disable. This is what it's doing. So in the menu here, we can disable or enable the full area tracking. Subject to detect. Um, again, this was in the key menu. So we have people, animals, vehicles, or none, and we can focus on um, the driver of the vehicle if we enable spot detection on there. Eye detection, um, you can enable or disable this, but if you're photographing a person, it will still pick up the face and the eyes will be in focus. Um, but this just enables it to specifically pick out and look for the eyes of your subject. And if you're working with very shallow depth of field, this is a, a useful thing to enable. And at the bottom here, we can um, switch between manual focus or autofocus. Um, if you don't have this as a switch on your lens, it will be in this bit in the menu. The next one is preview AF. So this is when the camera is idling and it's not doing much and you just sort of sit it down, whether the camera is looking for something to focus on. So it's continually hunting. I always, and I don't know why it's enabled in this one, I always disable this because if you're waiting for a bird to leave a perch or re um, come into a perch or something like that, um, you're leaving the camera and waiting. If nothing happens for a little while, it's gonna get bored and just start hunting for things, which it means that you're, when you're actually ready to take a picture, it's not in the right place. So I tend to disable this. Um, AF assist beam firing. There's a little light on the side of the camera here that um, illuminates your subject to help with the autofocus in very low light. Touch and drag AF settings. Um, we can enable this and what that does is allow us to uh, bring this viewfinder up to our eye and then drag our thumb across the touch screen and use that almost as a joystick. And it's really, really nice quick way of moving the focusing point around the, the, the screen. I really like this. I do recommend having it in relative and not absolute. Absolute can be very difficult to work with because it's got to be exactly where you put your thumb. Um, and the touch area on the right if you're a right-hand shooter or a left if you're a left-hand shooter. Uh, uh, sorry, left eye shooter. Um, down the bottom you can actually change the sensitivity as well, so how quickly it moves around. Below this we have manual focus peaking settings, so when you do set it to manual focus, when you, as you focus it, manual focus peaking will basically, as things come into focus, it will give a glowing outline of those that are in focus. And below that we have focus guides. Now focus guides are even better, 
Um, what this does is give you a little box with two little green arrows that kind of come in uh, to tell you whether you're front or back focusing, and they're more accurate than manual focus peaking. Below this we have manual foot servo autofocus, so um, whether when you're in video, sorry, movie servo autofocus, my mistake, uh, when you're in video and you're doing uh, a movie, whether the cam camera is continually focusing and tracking your subject, um, and if you want it to be, uh, when you're doing interviews and things and keeping that face in, you want this enabled. Next one, lens electronic manual focus. Um, this is whether the camera will allow the autofocus to be overridden with uh, manual focus after you've um, hit autofocus. So when you're in one shot and you start autofocus and it locks it, can you override it with the um, focus ring? I tend to leave that on the default there. Um, the focus and control ring, so you can actually change the setting of this front ring on this lens. Some of them have a switch on the lens that changes it from focus or control, but it can be used as a control ring, which is a customizable um, setting ring. Similar to how we have a dial up here, you can do that with this as well. Now, um, for the case of this, what I'm gonna do is just set it to focus. And then go back across to um, here and just change this to manual so I can show you the focus guides. So here we go. As I come into focus, it's gonna go green and then we can go out of focus or in front or back focusing and then it's gonna go green when it's in focus. It's a really, really accurate way of uh, manually focusing if you need to or want to use manual focus. Um, right, let's go back to the menu. Let's re-enable autofocus and we'll go across to the next one, which is the playback menu. In playback menu, we have the option to protect images. So you can add a lock to certain images and you can um, find all of your protected images easier. You can arrange groups of images or whole folders or single images here. Um, you can rotate still, so if you uh, if the camera didn't register that it was in portrait or landscape, or it you know you're doing it from vertically and it can't quite work it out, um, you can rotate them. And movies, there is a setting that you can enable to uh, let the camera know that you're shooting in portrait video, um, or automatically detect that you're working in portrait video. But if you haven't done that, you can change the rotation information here. Um, you can set your ratings of images as well in here. Um, which is a star rating, one to five stars, um, which can make it easier for selection when you bring it onto the computer because it embeds that information into the metadata of the image. Um, you can set up a print order here. Um, you get more options on a computer anyway, so I don't know why you'd want to do this in camera. Um, we can go in here and set creative assist so we can apply filters and looks to the images here. Um, similar with creative filters, that's the sort of uh, fish eye effect or things like that, and those ones you can add. You can do red eye correction in camera, so if your flash, pop-up flash has caused red eye, you can get rid of that in camera, which is really useful. We can resize images, we can crop images, and we can, um, uh, which is, both of those are useful when you need to send off an image, so you transfer it over to a mobile phone or something and ping it off to somebody. Um, you can do that all in camera. If you have been shooting in HEF and you need to convert it to JPEG for compatibility reasons for sending to someone, uh, you can do that in camera too. Um, the next one is slideshow, so if you're connected up via HDMI lead onto a screen you can set up a slideshow to, to go through your images. Um, we can search for images on the memory card here. Um, when you press the playback button on the next, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at, when you want to look at your images, does it show you the last image that you looked at or does it show you the most recent image every single time? I leave that on view from last scene because if you're showing someone an image and it times out and you know goes to sleep and then you try again, it's gonna have moved again, which is quite annoying. Um, image jump with the front top scroll wheel. Um, so you can skip through images using the D-pad one image at a time, but if you need to skip through multiple, you can use a top wheel. Uh, and I tend to leave that on 10. But you can actually set it to skip folders or dates or jump by a certain number of images. Um, it's entirely up to you.
Oops. Ten. Right, the next one, playback four, playback information display. How much info does it show you if you press up and down during playback? Um, or tap through the info button rather on, on playback. There's a lot of screens here and not everyone uses all of them, so um, it can be worth disabling some of those. AF point display, it will show you with a little red uh, square where the camera uh, was focusing during the picture and give you a, a grid overlay here to check your composition. Uh, if you're doing movies, um, you've got rec record time or time code for the um, play count, which uh, if you're using multiple image, um, cameras and synchronizing them, you'd use time code. Um, I've never set that up. Uh, I just tend to leave it on record time personally. HDMI, H HDMI, HDR output. So if you're doing the output via HDMI, to a HDR screen and you want to get the best out of it, you can set this to HDR output on. Okay, the next menu is the connectivity menu. So the connectivity menu enables us to connect to a smartphone, uh, a Bluetooth remote for remote shutter release. Um, we've got EOS utility if you're connecting up to a computer via your USB. Image.canon is a web-based service for um, storage of image, so you can actually upload it via your 5G connection to a um, cloud storage thing for backup. And we can actually print directly from the camera to a Wi-Fi printer. Um, we can also set up advanced connection there, which I've never needed to do personally. Um, so if you need to do a smartphone or tablet, you just tap here, it will um, need a memory card in there to do it, but it will take you through a wizard to uh, set up the Wi-Fi hotspot that the camera sets up and then you just open the Wi-Fi settings on your uh, smartphone to connect to this device or you can uh, set it up via Bluetooth connection to your device and then it will do the Wi-Fi settings for you after that. And in that case, you open the app first, um, open the settings on here, and then it will find the Bluetooth uh, device. So you don't go to your settings and find the Bluetooth device, you do it in the Canon Camera Connect app. Um, connectivity menu number two, we have airplane mode. So if you need to disable all electromagnetic signatures, you can do that here, so you can turn that off or turn that on so that everything is turned off. Um, Wi-Fi settings. Uh, we can go in here and completely disable just the Wi-Fi and we can disable or enable the Bluetooth settings here as well. We can name the camera, so if you've got multiple, you can make it easier to find uh, your one when you're searching for the Wi-Fi. Uh, we can set up GPS settings. So the camera doesn't have GPS built in, but it can do it via your mobile phone. So if you have it connected up to the app, it can use that phone's GPS data and embed that information into the images, which is very clever. Um, below that, you can view any error details. If, you, if it picks up any errors, it will give you some information about what that error was here. Uh, so you can troubleshoot it and then reset communication settings. Now, if you do have issues with um, Wi-Fi settings ever, what I tend to do is just reset it and see if it works again, and it normally does. The yellow menu, uh, spanner menu one. We have select folder. We can um, we can have multiple folders in the image, but if you're working between them, you can go and pick the, the folder that you want to work in here. Uh, file number, continuous or manual reset. Um, so we can set auto reset, which is would be more annoying because if you change card during a shoot, it's gonna go back to zero again. And every time you do that during one shoot, that means you're gonna get conflicts of images with the same name. We can format our memory card here. We can turn on auto rotate for the camera or just the computer or entirely off. I tend to leave it on the, just the computer because that way when you're showing a portrait image on the, the back screen, you just move the camera into portrait and you can see a larger copy of it rather than it going into sort of landscape. Um, to show a portrait image, which makes it very, very small on the screen. I hope that makes sense. Um, add video rotation info. Hopefully this is enabled by default. I can't remember if it is, but certainly you do want to enable that for the most part if you're doing any social media videos using this camera, which I imagine a lot of you will be. Um, you can set the date and time here, and we can set the language as well. We have a lot to choose from. There's a lot of languages in here. Um, the next one, video ooh, video system is um, NTSC or PAL, 
We work on NTSC in this country, um, in the UK, in Europe as well. Um, in the US, they tend to use PAL, and that is meaning less and less when we're using stuff, uh, using content online um, rather than on TV. Uh, mode guide. Um, we have the option to enable or disable mode guide. So when you change the mode on the mode dial, it gives you some information about what that mode means and does. Feature guide equally, when you find things in the uh, menu or on the cue screen, it will give you a little bit of information about what that is and what it does. Um, beep is the camera will beep when it uh, you're in one shot focus and it locks focus and there's a few other areas where it will beep. I tend to disable this because I like to not have the camera beeping ever. Power saving. Um, these settings are not the default. I've had to do this so that it doesn't go to sleep while I'm doing this video. Um, the screen off will normally be on set to something like 30 seconds or um, something like that. And this is just, if you need the camera to not turn off, you can set it here. But for the most part, you want to leave it on the default so that you're not draining battery um, unnecessarily. Spanner menu. Spanner menu three, um, screen and viewfinder brightness, or uh, display, sorry, rather, you can determine where it switches between the viewfinder or the back screen. Um, by default, the top one is the one that's enabled, so when you have the screen folded out like that, it will not use the viewfinder at all. And the assumption there is that you're doing some video, and if you're doing video quite low down or close to your chest or your hair gets close to it, it enables that proximity sensor and turns this screen off and switches it to the viewfinder, which would be really annoying. If you prefer that, you can set it to auto too, so even when the screen's out, it will still switch to the viewfinder. Or you can set it manually uh, to viewfinder and screen, entirely up to you. You can change the brightness of the screen here, and you can change the um, brightness of the viewfinder separately. Um, you can actually fine tune the color tone of the viewfinder specifically, um, sometimes uh, with age of the camera um, or just to your eye, it might not look quite the same as the other screen or how you want it to, so you can adjust that there. User interface magnification. If you find that the interface is too small on this screen, um, you can enable this and then you just double tap the screen with two fingers and it magnifies into anything you want it to. Um, you can force the HDMI resolution to be on 1080. That's going out of the HDMI port. Uh, number four, we have touch control. We can set this to sensitive or standard or disable the touch screen entirely if you wanted to. Um, if you are wearing gloves, you can um, put it on sensitive and it should pick up through the gloves a bit easier. Um, USB connection app. Uh, because the USB-C can do so many things out, um, it is necessary to pick the thing that you want it to do here. We have uh, photo import or um, remote control via the um, software with the USB-C there, or you can have it set up to be the webcam, um, plug and play webcam using the video calls and streaming settings. And the camera has what's called MFI certification, so you can uh, connected up to apps via the iPhone. MFI is an Apple-centric uh, certification for uh, working directly with iPhone via USB-C, via, via the USB-C to Lightning or USB-C now to the newer iPhones, which is cool. Um, right, red menu five, we have reset camera. If we go in here, we have basic settings, which will re reset all camera settings, but it doesn't reset all camera settings. That's, that's a bit of a lie. Uh, it'll, the other settings are all here. So you have a lot of different areas of the um, camera that you can reset individual things. And all of these won't be affected if you reset the basic settings. Um, right, it's a bit odd. Battery information. Um, we can get a bit of uh, info as to how well this battery is performing. Uh, thankfully mine is on maximum, which is great. A lot of my older batteries are now waning and Inevitably, batteries do kind of um, fall off over time, so you can keep an eye on it there. Copyright information. Um, we can put in our copyright information, so we can put your contact details or your, your name uh, in here, and it will actually embed that into the metadata of your image, so you can view that on the computer. Um, manual software URL, so if you need to get to the full manual, 
you can use this QR code to scan and, and find it on your phone. Obviously you won't need to do that now because you've seen this video. So there. Certification, so something we have to have in the camera. Uh, firmware updates you can do from firmware here. So you can check your firmware of the lens and the camera. But if you need to update your firmware, you can put the firmware onto a blank SD card, plug it in, go in here, click the camera and it will update it from this bit. Or you can use the app, the Canon Camera Connect app that I mentioned, and that will enable you to uh, do the firmware updates wirelessly. Um, it's a really slick uh, process. Right, going across the orange menu, um, ISO expansion, we can enable this to allow uh, the ISO to go to even higher levels. Um, and safety shift, when you are shooting and it, the camera thinks you are really overblown, like really too overexposed it, or really too dark, it will just shift the exposure to, to within uh, range so you're not clipping or losing detail. Uh, Customise buttons. This is a really, 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 really useful menu to have a look through because you can customise a lot of the buttons here to work more efficiently for you. Um, these buttons, these cameras are designed to come out of the box and be great for everybody, but not perfect for anyone. Um, the type of photography or the type of the way that you work will determine the, the, the setup for you. And there's loads of things you can customize here. Most of these buttons are um, changeable. So have a little play and, um, and see what works for you. Customize control rings, so um, the, the, the control ring I mentioned on the lens, you can customize what that does here, and you can clear the customized settings there as well. Number three, release shutter without lens. If you're using the adapter and you're using older lenses or adapted um, lenses that don't have a chip in them um, and don't have electronic communication, the camera won't recognize that it has a lens on there, so you might need to enable this. By default, it's off. Um, so you're not taking pictures with a when when there's no lens on it at all. Below that we have relax, retract lens when power off. Um, some lenses when they focus, uh, the front element moves forward and backwards, and sometimes can stick out a bit of a way. What this does is when you turn the camera off, it'll bring that back. Um, if you are doing something like stop motion work, you don't want that to happen because every time you turn the camera off to change the battery or change your memory card. Um, your lens is going to shift and then you have to refocus and, and, and reset the camera up. So I tend to turn this off in some cases uh, if it's appropriate, but for the most part I'll leave it on. And then we can clear all custom functions there as well. The last bit in the menu is the green My Menu Setup. So we can go in here and set up a specific menu for you. So if all of those things that I've shown you through the menu, if you only use a small handful of them, Finding them can be uh, a little bit time consuming because you've got to go find the right section of the menu and find the item that you want. But if you use a regular four or five things, you can set up a My Menu tab and set the, just those four or five things in this bit. And you can set up multiple My Menu tabs. You can have one for landscape, one for videography, one for um, portraiture, whatever you want to do. Okay, now I'm going to switch to video and we're going to go back through the menu a little bit. There's not a huge amount in here. But in the shooting mode here we have uh, different to the mode on the dial because we don't have a, a mode for the mode dial specifically for video. We can set auto exposure video, manual video, uh, close-up demo and demonstration video situation which is like a scene mode for um, the video. Movie IS mode so we, uh, it turns up the IS stuff. We can do HDR video um, so it's using it's like having multiple frames and combining them to, to give you more, more dynamic range. It's similar to that. And we have movie auto exposure uh, custom. So we can set up a custom mode um, and save that. Um, right. I'm going to go to manual for now and then I can go into the full menu. Below that we have movie record size. Um, and you'll notice we have more options than we did in the uh, stills menu side of this. We can set 4K and we can set Full HD in the same way and we have options in terms of um, frame rate but you'll notice we have one with another logo on it which is a, a light IPB 
which is a more compressed format, so it'll take less space up on the card. If you're editing the video and you're cutting thing, the video down a little bit, um, the, le 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 the, the more compression you have, the harder your computer has to work because it has to um, sort of uh, render that um, footage. So if you're editing, it tends to be better to use the full standard IPB. If you're not going to do any editing, you, you can use the light IPB and um, you get a smaller, take up less space on your hard drives and your memory cards. Next to that we have high frame rate mode. We can go in here and set it to uh, enable and what this will do is shoot at 120 frames per second in uh, full HD. This will not record the audio during those clips but it will give you really, really beautiful slow-mo footage. Let's disable that for now. Um, if we are in full HD at 30 frames per second we can actually set up digital zoom as well so we can magnify into the image which will give us a little bit more flexibility with our lenses if we don't have a lens with enough zoom, but it will still give you that full 1080p resolution because it just uses a smaller part of the sensor and crops in a bit. Let's disable that. Sound recording, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can set this to manual and set your levels. It will um, do it automatically, but in the quiet points, it will kind of hunt for audio and sometimes raise the level and pick up background noise. Um, Things that are different in here, so we've got ISO speed settings for video, uh, we can set up HDRPQ um, setting for video, uh, which is the standard, as I said, for uh, TVs. Um, we can actually set up different increments for our aperture. So in the aperture, on in the stills mode, you have the option of doing uh, one third stops um, between in each increment as you change the aperture. In video, with RF lenses, you can reduce that to one eighth stop, so you get a smoother um, change in exposure when, as you change your aperture. Um, I think that might be it. Oh, no, no, not quite. So movie menu four, we have time-lapse movie. We can set this up here. Um, I can't do that because I'm connected via HDMI, so it won't let me, but you can set up the camera to take a frame of video every five seconds for 10 hours if you wanted to, something like that, as long as you've got power going to the camera um, or enough battery. And it will combine all of that footage to create you a lovely time-lapse video. Movie self timer is a useful thing in this situation where I'm filming myself. I can set it to 10 seconds or two seconds. I can press the record, sit down, and I don't have that awkward bit in the footage where I'm kind of moving to and from the camera. Um, Image stabilization mode, um, digital IS, we actually have the option of on or enhanced here, so we can, it essentially crops into the image slightly and uses that range of the sensor to um, allow you more image stabilization. And we have the auto level um, bit as well, which, as I said, kind of keeps the horizon steady if you're hand holding. Um, we also have down here zebra settings. So what zebra does is as you're recording, it will show you these lines on the screen if your exposure is over a certain point. So above 70% um, roughly, it will start showing those lines so you know you're getting close to it, the uh, exposure clipping at, at the highlights. Or at 100%, it's a different pattern and you know that you've gone over, you've overexposed those areas of the image. So it just helps with keeping your um, exposures correct. Uh, that is it. Oh, uh, AF menu has some other bits, so we can change the movie servo area, um, and we can set up a specific different focusing grouping and, and stuff in the video mode compared to the stills mode. Uh, and we can actually set up here the servo AF speed. Now this is quite useful because when you tap to focus on one area and then you tap to focus on another area of the, the scene, you might want a lovely smooth pull focus from one subject to the next. So you might want the AF speed to go on a bit slower. You don't need this in stills because you kind of want the camera to focus as quickly as possible all the time in stills mode. But in video, that can be a bit jarring. So we can, we can adjust that here. So that's everything. That's everything in a Canon EOS R50. 
I hope that was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, do leave them in the comments. I will check back on this video uh, periodically to answer them, but I'm sure other people in the community and the Wex guys will be happy to help as well. Um, do drop me a message on Instagram. I'm at rajk.photo if you have any other questions as well. Um, thank you very much for watching. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.